Hey everybody, how you doing? Hope everything's going well lately. Um, we're going to move into chapter six today um, in our lecture. And chapter six is the integumentary system. So let's go ahead and jump in and let's get at it. Integument integumentary system consists of two main components. I know here it says skin and its derivatives. I like to say skin and its accessory structures. So here we see that the skin is actually also called the cutaneous membrane, as we learned in a previous chapter. And that the skin, if you want to go ahead and give yourself a note, is really the epidermis plus the dermis. Now, those accessory structures, or what they like to call the derivatives of, of the integumentary system, are nails, hair, and glands. Okay, so those are the three groups of accessory structures or derivatives, nails, hair, and glands. And that's really what we're going to focus on in this chapter. We're going to talk about the skin, the epidermis, and the dermis. We'll mention the subcutaneous, but then we'll also focus on all of these accessory structures and kind of discuss what they're doing as well. So the integument is the skin and it covers the body. It's also referred to as the cutaneous membrane and it is a barrier to the outside world. And as it mentions right here, this is something that I want you to know is a visual health indicator. So it's an indicator of your health. If you're not feeling well, many times you show up to class and one of your friends looks at you and says, yeah, you look like crap, you know? And so Visually, we can tell through our skin many times the condition of ourselves on the end, like our physical health. So it is a health indicator. Dermatology, everyone has probably heard that term. Dermatology is the study and treatment of skin. The integument, it is the body's largest organ, or uh, a lot of people consider it an organ, but here we're also considering it to be the organ system. Um, but the integument itself, just the skin, makes up about 7 to 8% of your total body weight. Um, and, you know, you don't have to worry about these numbers, um, you know, if we laid it out kind of as a rug. Um, the integument, the reason that we hit the integument first as far as systems is because it's the simplest. This is the easiest system to start with. This is the first place that we can see all four major tissue types. We're going to see the epidermis is epithelium. We'll see the dermis is mainly connective tissue. In the dermis, we're going to have some smooth muscles that's going to be associated with a hair called an erector pili muscle. So there's our example of muscle. And then we're going to have various nervous tissues, nerves, free nerve endings, Meisner's corpuscles, or the tactiles, the pacinian or the lamellated corpuscles. So we're going to see those in lab. We'll mention some of these as we go through lecture. So here we can kind of, kind of see the epidermis and the dermis. The subcutaneous is many times not considered to be part of the integument, but some kind of consider it to be. We're going to discuss it in this chapter um, because it is related to the integument very closely if it's not considered to be part of it. Okay, so epidermis. Let's don't forget that the epidermis is really just layers of cells. It's stratified squamous epithelium. So here we've got many layers of those flat cells and it just provides protection, the outer layer of protection and waterproofing. The dermis is the deeper layer. It's mainly some some connective tissue, some dense irregular, sometimes some loose connective tissue depending on where you're at. So let's take a look. That subcutaneous as well. As I mentioned, this is deep to the dermis. I prefer many times to call it the hypodermis. That way we've got the epi above the dermis and then the hypo below. And that kind of helps us to keep track of those different layers. But the sub Q, the subcutaneous or the hypodermis layer, this is not considered to be part of the integument. But again, we're going to discuss it here because it's associated with it, intimately connected to it. Um, so one of the things that I want you to focus on with the subcutaneous is that it is mainly adipose tissue. I don't know what alveolar tissue is. So this is not a word. This is a mistake in the presentation. It's mainly um, adipose tissue. So we're going to see a bunch of yellow down there and then um, we'll see some blood vessels. That's about it. One of the main things here, speaking of hypodermis, this is where the needle got its term because a hypodermic needle in places injections into the subcutaneous layer. This is the most common type of injection is a hypodermic injection. As we move through, we can see again, down here in the yellow is going to be the subcutaneous layer. Up above, whenever we see purple and above, this is the epidermis. So that means between the purple and the yellow, this is going to be our dermis layer. Okay. 
Now, let's talk about the epidermis. We're going to head into the epidermis first, and then we'll take a look at the dermis and go um, into those accessory structures. So the epidermis is made of epithelium, right? So it is stratified squamous, and it's found in several different layers. And if you've never heard the term strata, strata is a term that refers to different layering. Stratification means to layer something. Um, so we can look, for example, out in the deserts where we have like the Grand Canyon, and we can see the different strata, the different layers of the earth um, that have been laid down over millions and millions of years. Here are those layers and you need to be familiar with them. Deep to superficial is what we're listing them as here. The stratum basal or basally. This is also called the stratum germanitivum is the innermost layer. Next layer up is the stratum spinosum, then the stratum granulosum, Finally, the stratum lucidum is only found in thick skin. Pull this one out. Make sure that you put a little star beside it. This is only found in thick skin. The other four layers are all that's found in thinner skin. And so we'll talk about that thick skin on the palms and the soles of your feet, where it's located. Everywhere else in the body just has four layers. The last outermost layer, the layer that's always being exposed to the environment and that you're touching if you touch your skin, is your stratum corneum. So the corneum is the uppermost layer, and it is the main dead protective layer. Now, when we look here, I'm just going to zoom past that. Let's go ahead and let's start, start talking about these different layers. Let's take care of that before we get into anything else. The stratum basal, or as I mentioned, stratum germanitivum is another term. This is the deepest of the epidermis layers. So this is the one at the bottom. This is going to be just a single layer of cells and there's several different types of cells down here and we can see these different types of cells. The stratum basal or basally is going to connect to the basement membrane and this is what's going to connect the epidermis to the dermis right or the epithelium to the tissue and so this is right above that basement membrane three types of cells let's talk about them first keratinocytes keratinocytes are the primary type of cell that's in the skin that's in the epidermis so these are the most abundant cells keratinocytes these guys make what their name implies. They make a very tough waterproof substance called keratin. So keratin is where these cells get their name because they make a lot of keratin inside. They make so much keratin that they end up killing themselves. They pack their cells full of keratin and then they destroy their organelles and they end up kind of becoming just a membrane packed full of this waterproof strong material. And by the time they reach that outer stratum, the stratum corneum, then that's all that we have are just dead waterproof cells. At this point they're living but as they move towards the top they get away from the blood vessels because epidermis doesn't have blood vessels and so they start to die and then we start to link them together to create our upper layers of skin. Melanocytes. Melanocytes produce melanin and melanin is our skin pigment. Now we've got two different types of pigment. We have melanin and then we have keratin. Keratin is more of a yellow, orangey kind of color, but melanin is more of a darker color. So we usually talk about melanin being in three or four different varieties. Many times there's a light kind of yellowish color. Then there's more of a brownish color. Sometimes that's split up into more of a light tan and a darker brown. And then there's usually more of a darker blackish coloration. And so those are the three or four main types, main flavors, if you will, of melanin. And that tends to create the different colorations on our planet. Now, melanin is going to interact eventually with that sunlight. And so it can make it darker to produce more melanin, more sunlight, lighter. If there's less sunlight, we produce less melanin. So that can be effective as well. The melanin kind of sets the baseline and then other things can kind of change the coloration of our skin around that baseline. 
Melanocytes create these little bubbles full of melanin, and these are called melanosomes. These guys like to pack around the nuclei, and I definitely want you to know this. The main function of melanin is to protect the stem cells, to protect the DNA, especially of the stem cells, protect the, the DNA of all the cells that are here in this epidermis, but especially those that are going to be making other cells. And that's something that's not really mentioned down here in the stratum basal that I want to mention is that this is also where stem cells are located. So let's go ahead and add that note. This is not the tactile cells. This is something I'm just adding in right now. I just realized that it's not there. But there are stem cells located in this area, and the stem cells are going to divide to produce all of the new keratinocytes especially. So we're going to have some stem cells, and they're always going to be spitting out brand new cells down here in this bottommost layer and then those cells are going to migrate towards the top and towards the outside of your skin and then eventually they're going to be shed into the environment right that's mainly what household dust is is just dead skin cells but the stem cells that are down down there are super important because they are going to create most of the rest of the cells that are here in these other layers now there is also tactile cells these are also called Merkel cells you can see that here so this is touch sensation. These Merkel cells are another term for these tactile cells. I want you to know that Merkel cells provide very light touch, very, very light touch. These, these are the highest in the integument, the highest tactile cells in the integument. So these are going to perceive the lightest possible touch. The stratum spinosum. The stem cells that were down in the um, stratum basal and the stratum germanitivum, and that's where the term comes from, basal or germanitive refers to growth or basal refers to the stem cells. So the cells that were made down there in those stem cells start to migrate upwards and outwards towards the top of your skin, towards the outer layers of your skin. And so the cells that were made down there, the first layer that they become are the stratum spinosum, the next layer up. These cells start to look a little bit spiny, and that's the reason that we get the term spinosum. The one thing that I want you to um, know about the stratum spinosum, there's really two things. The first thing is here is where we're going to connect these cells. We're going to connect the keratinocytes that have stopped dividing. So the ones that have stopped growing, we're going to connect them to each other with desmosomes. And this is important. Desmosomes connect these cells together. And then that turns our skin, instead of individual cells, it turns it into more of a sheet, right? So think about whenever you get a sunburn and you start to peel, you peel in layers in sheets. And it's because these desmosomes have connected all those cells together to make that layer. Now something else that's down in this stratum spinosum are these longer Han cells are also called epidermal dendritic cells. These are types of immune cells. So I want you to understand that these are immune cells and many times they respond to pathogens but also skin cancer, superficial skin cancer, epidermal skin cancer. And so these cells prevent skin cancer from developing as often as it does, but skin cancer is still the number one type of cancer that we encounter in the U.S. and possibly in the world just because we don't kind of protect ourselves as often as we should. As those cells have already been linked, now they're moving up into this, this grainy looking layer, the granular layer called stratum granulosum. The stratum granulosum, the key to it is this is where this process right here, keratinization, this is where the process of keratinization begins. It's going to finish towards the top of the granulosum or the bottom of the corneum overall, but keratinization is the process of filling the keratinocytes with keratin, destroying the organelles and booting them out of the cell. And now all that we've got is simply just a dead cell with a membrane with keratin inside, but they are linked together now by those desmosomes. So this is what creates the outer dead layers of skin that make up most of our epidermis and that protect us the most in um, our protection processes.
Okay, so keratinization, again, we're going to pack the cell full of keratin, destroy it, and get rid of its organelles, and they're linked together. Now we just have dead waterproof cells that are linked together. Now I use the term waterproof loosely. They're really water resistant. We're going to see that a small amount of water does evaporate through these cells, between these cells every day, but overall it does tend to keep all of the water into our body except for maybe one cup. Okay, so that's not very much in the least bit. The stratum lucidum, as I mentioned, the stratum lucidum is only found in thick skin. This is the layer always below the corneum, above the granulosum, in thick skin. And if you ever see a stratum lucidum in any image, you know that you are looking at thick skin. This is a very compacted um, uh, protein layer, a Leiden. You don't have to know that, but the whole key is this is what creates the thickness there for the palms and the soles, as well as the extra layers of the outermost layer. And the stratum corneum is the outermost layer of the epidermis. 20 to 30 layers of dead, interking, keratinized cells. That's a great way to put it, right? We've got these dead cells. They're packed with keratin, and they're connected by desmosomes, so they are interlocking. Now, these cells, again, because they're dead, they're here. This is our main protective layer. This is kind of our main waterproof layer um, and it's really kind of the most superficial and the most protective. Now a lot of bacteria, a lot of microorganisms, you know, things that can live on, on other um, living organisms, they may not want to live on our skin because we use a lot of secretions to help prevent that. So we have antibacterial secretions that we use to help kind of do that. Now as I mentioned, these keratinocytes that are in the stratum corneum originated from a stem cell in the stratum basal or the stratum germanitivum. They traveled up through the spinosum and granulosum until they hit that corneum. And it usually takes from the stratum basal to the stratum corneum about two weeks, right? And then it stays another two weeks or so in the stratum corneum. And so a, stem, a skin cell that is shed right now and becomes dust in the air was probably made around a month ago, and it took it that long to travel all the way up through those layers. Now again, we're not going to repair that after we lose it. We're not going to try to repair the layers on top. We're going to replace from the bottom. And so that way we can keep getting fresh cells um, that move upwards. Here is the stratum basal or the stratum germanitivum. The next layer up is the stratum spinosum. Then we get the granulosum, the lucidum, and finally the corneum. Obviously, if we saw lucidum over there, that means that was an image of thick skin as well. Variations in the epidermis. So how can the epidermis kind of vary between individuals or even between areas on the body? Well, it tells us right here that there are variations between different body regions and differences between individuals, and there's differences in thicknesses and color and skin markings. So let's kind of talk about that. First, I've already alluded to it, thick versus thin skin. Thick skin has the stratum lucidum. Thick skin is found on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet, um, you know, surface of your fingers and toes, uh, anywhere that you can see prints, fingerprints. If you look on your palm, you can also kind of see kind of palm prints and fingerprints that kind of run down onto the palm. And so um, these regions are where the thick skin is located. Basically, anywhere where we directly interact with the environment more often, that's where we're going to have thicker skin. So walking, we're going to see it on our soles, and then manipulating things with our hands, we're going to see it on our hands as well. Okay. One of the things about this, this has more sweat glands. It doesn't just have sweat glands. It has more sweat glands than other locations. If you haven't noticed when you get nervous, the first place that you start to sweat from is either your palms or the soles of your feet. And it's because you've got more sweat glands in those two locations than the rest of the body overall. Now, you shouldn't have hair growing on your palms or the soles of your feet. We know that old joke. And you shouldn't have sebaceous glands. And we haven't talked about these yet. But you shouldn't have oil glands. You have sweat glands making sweat, but you don't have oily glands on the palms or the soles because then that would inhibit us interacting with our environment. The thin skin covers most of the rest, it covers the rest of the body. If it's not kind of the palms and the soles, then it's going to be covered with thin skin. This one doesn't have that stratum lucidum. 
Okay, it's got your typical sweat glands distributed with hair follicles producing hair and sebaceous glands. So this is going to be our typical skin overall is going to be thin and then thick is just that specific example. Now, some of the variations in epidermis have to do with coloration. As I mentioned, coloration um, has to do with pigments, but it also has to do with something else. So go ahead and make a note, first off, that the coloration of the skin is due to two big variables. The first variable is um, the pigments. So we're going to talk about melanin, and we're going to talk about... Um, we're also going to talk about um, carotene, okay? But the second influence that can change the color of your skin is the amount of blood flow, the circulation to the skin. And so blood flow to the skin is also um, very important because the more blood going to the skin, the skin is going to become darker or become more red. Think about whenever you exercise. When you exercise, your skin starts, your the blood vessels in your skin start to dilate, so that means more blood's heading towards the dermis. And as a result, then you begin to look darker. If you are a dark-skinned individual, if you're a fair-skinned individual, then you start to look red right and so or even orangey right and so blood flow towards the skin more blood flow can equal darker okay coloration again melanin is one of our two skin pigments I want you to understand stand that there's not just one pigment melanin there's another one so melanin is the main one that has our main colorations here our textbook breaks it down into four colors black a brown, a tan, and more of a yellowish, yellow-brown shade, a lighter color, right? So we go from lightest towards darkest, right? So it's very simple. You inherited melanin from your parents, and so, you know, whatever skin colorations your parents had, you're going to have kind of that combination of those two skin tones. So if both of your parents were more of a dark-skinned individual, well, then you inherited more of that darker melanin. If more of your, if both of your parents were fair-skinned, then you inherited more of that yellow shade of melanin, right? So this is all just genetics. You know, you inherit which flavor from your mama and your daddy. Not that big of a deal. Now, these melanocytes, they tend to stain and they tend to release their melanin and it kind of stains those keratinocytes. So the keratinocytes are going to get stained by this melanin as they're moving upwards through the skin. But also don't forget this melanin is important to protect the nuclei. It likes to pack around the nuclei of our, of our cells, especially stem cells, to protect them from ultraviolet light, right? Ultraviolet light can cause the, the DNA in those cells to mutate and then start to cause some real serious trouble. And so as a result, we have our natural sunscreen, which is melanin, but it does give us our skin pigment. The more sun we encounter, the more pigment we're going to produce. If your, your family, your people, the people you originated from, lived closer to the equator or closer to more direct sunlight, then you're more likely to have a darker skin tone, right? So we kind of see that near the equator. We're going to see kind of more of the brown skin tone. Just outside of the equator, we're going to start to see some of that brown and that blacker skin tone as well. And so really the area of the planet where your genetics developed is why you got the melanin that you inherited, right? Depending on your parents, okay? Now, um, besides melanin, and here is a melanocyte, and it's kind of making these melanosomes. We can even see how it stained these cells, right? Besides melanin, the other skin pigment is carotene, not keratin. Keratin is that waterproof protein. Keratin is that yellow-orange pigment. Keratin, we have to eat, so it's a vitamin. We get it when we convert vitamin A. So we have to eat vitamin A from yellow and orange plants, right? So eating carrots is a good way to get this. It accumulates in the subcutaneous fat and in the keratinocytes, and so 
if you inherit the lightest color melanin and you have more carotene, then you are going to be more of a reddish skin tone and you might have red hair or even orange hair, right? And so that's kind of, if this is more dominant, then we start to see more of that red and orange tone for the hair and the skin, okay? Now, some of the other skin markings, for example, a nevus. A nevus is a commonly called a, a mole, right? So it's a harmless overgrowth of a melanin-forming cell. So it's a harmless overgrowth of a melanocyte. They rarely become malignant, but you, you need to monitor them just in case, right? Um, because if this mole becomes malignant and becomes um, melanoma, then that's extremely aggressive, and that is definitely um, a tough cancerous situation to, to fight off. Freckles. Freckles. I just talked about this with my daughter. She was asking me the other day about freckles. Why do I have a freckle on my nose, Papa? And the whole key is that freckles are where we see a little bit of um, increased melanocyte activity just in one area. We're not increasing the activity all around as a blanket. We're just increasing one or two melanocytes in that little region to become more active and therefore we're producing a little bit extra pigmentation and we can kind of see that. Now of course exposure to the sun is what triggers melanin production so that's also what triggers freckle production and that's the reason she's noticed it. She's like hey when I start to get a suntan I also start to get freckles. What's up with that? You know so we had a discussion. Another variation in epidermis has to do with the the Let's just go ahead and put it straight. We're talking about fingerprints here, okay? They're properly called friction ridges. And what these friction ridges are good for is to help provide friction whenever we grasp things. If we contact anything, trying to open a jar, for example. If we had slick skin that would, didn't have any ridges on it, then it wouldn't be able to grab a hold of that lid and be able to spin it off very well. And so it does increase the friction overall. Now, that's really what they're for, but we know that now... Um, law enforcement has started using these friction ridges, you know, or they've used them for a long time, your fingerprints to identify people. Because um, each person's 10 fingerprints are unique, it's a unique combination, then we can use these fingerprints to help identify somebody. If we just have one fingerprint, it may not be possible, but a combination of more fingers gives us a little bit better. Um, better possibility of identifying that person. More than one person may have that one looking, that one fingerprint. It may look exactly the same on one finger, but all the rest of the fingers combined are going to be very individual. Okay, and that's the reason we can use them that way. Here's some different examples: arches and whirls and loops and things like that. Not that big of a deal, but you can look at your fingerprints and thumbprints and kind of see some of these different details if you haven't before. It's kind of cool. It's kind of artistic, you know. Um, as I mentioned, UV radiation is very important. It it helps to stimulate melanin production. We're going to find out that UV radiation also stimulates um, eventually vitamin D3 in your skin. So I hear people saying, you know, oh, I went outside and got some sun. I got my D3 today. Well, you didn't get D3 from the sun. You got D3 from milk. You got D3 from something else. If it's a vitamin, you have to eat it. And so you eat this vitamin D3 in some form, and then the sunlight converts it into another chemical. And that's what's so important. So I want you to know this. Small amounts of UV radiation are very important to absorb calcium and phosphorus into the intestines. What happens is sunlight converts D3 into a hormone eventually that goes to your intestines. And again, the function is it helps absorb calcium and phosphates into the body. So without this sunlight triggering D3 to become another hormone, we would not absorb enough calcium and enough phosphates. And we see this in people many times that don't go outside and don't get enough exercise. This can be part of a cause of their brittle bones in, the, in osteoporosis. Too much ultraviolet radiation, though. Too much can be bad. As I mentioned, this can start to cause skin cancer. And so um, creating skin, ca skin cancer is not something that we would like to deal with. So it's not believed to cause skin cancer. We know it causes skin cancer. That's about silly. 
Okay, so we know that this causes skin cancer, UV radiation. So sunscreen tries to block this radiation as much as possible with that SPF, that sun protection factor. Um, and then we do see some people that tend to kind of be RNG, you know, so we know some RNG people in this in this um country right now. And so sunless tanners start to create tan skin without UV light. Some of them can try to trigger melanocytes, but some of them actually just paint the skin and make it look orange, right? It doesn't really offer any protection. This is simply just, you know, kind of more of, of, of that narcissistic kind of thing, right? Just trying to get yourself a certain um, tone of skin because you think maybe that's prettier than something else. And, you know, I mean, we're all created different. We need to accept who we are. So these sunless tanners, they're not really good for true tanning. They don't provide the protection. Now let's, let's talk about the dermis real quick, okay? Now actually, before I leave this, I'm not sure how this happened, but I do want to make a comment back here under the epidermis that the epidermis is classified based on its cell shape and its layers, right? So we mentioned this under, um, sorry for the pause. Well, we mentioned this under tissues. So we have already talked about this, but I want you to remember here that this epidermis is our stratified squamous epithelium. And so it is many layers of thin flat cells that are this just mainly there for protection. Then we get to the dermis. When we look at the dermis, the dermis is mainly connective tissue. And the, one of the main functions of the dermis is this is where we're going to start most of our accessory structures. So most of those accessory structures start down here and they move up and out through the epiderm epidermis. Here's that dermis, that blue layer, and we can kind of see below the purple and above the yellow is going to be that dermis. Again, we see hairs, we see some glands, we see all kinds of blood vessels, here's a muscle, we see various things over here, and that kind of shows us that this is where a lot of those accessory structures are going to originate. Now, components of the dermis, I do want you to know that it is mainly just connective tissue, but there are a lot of collagen and elastic fibers. Okay, there's a whole lot of these fibers in here. We're going to have a lot of blood vessels. We're going to have a lot of glands, nails, and hair are going to be down in this area. We're going to see some nerve endings. We're going to see some muscles, erector pili muscles. So again, this region is where we see most of our accessory structures, and that's really what these two lines are kind of focusing on. Now, we take that dermis, and we divide it into two layers. The upper layer, which is right below the epidermis and right below that stratum basal or, or germanitivum is the papillary layer. So the upper layer is called the papillary layer because there are these structures called dermal papilla. And I'll talk about them in just a second. Below that, before we get to the subcutaneous, we have the reticular layer. So the reticular layer is deeper. You can see that listed there. Papilla it's the more superficial region of the dermis. This, again, is what's directly below the epidermis. This is mainly loose connective tissue. Areolar connective tissue is our loose. Now, I want to switch and talk about dermal papillae and epidermal ridges from this picture over here. So I'm going to jump on over here and take a look. Here we can see these connections, right? These connections coming down, we call them epidermal ridges. Right, these were part of those friction ridges that showed up on the top. Now, these kind of mounds that are going to connect up to those ridges in the epidermis, and here it kind of looks like two egg cartons or two egg crate mattresses kind of linking together. These mounds are called dermal papillae. Now, the word papilla means mound, okay? It's a mounded structure. So dermal papilla is just the mound of the dermis towards the top. Now, because we've got these mounded dermal papillae towards the top, here we can see some and how they interlock with that dermis. Here they're ripping it apart to show us, right? So because we've got all these papilla towards the top, we call that region the papillary region. And below it, we refer to most of the area where the accessory structures are embedded as the reticular region. So again, that papillary layer is there mainly because of those projections called the dermal papilla. An individual one is without the E, just dermal papilla, 
with the E is plural. So if you see it either way, it means the same thing. It's just one versus more than one. And what the, these dermal papilla do is they interlock with the, the ridges of the epidermis that are going down into the dermis. These are called epidermal ridges. So the dermal papilla interlock with the epidermal ridges, and this creates a nice tight connection between the epidermis and the dermis. If you separate this connection, you will see a blister in that region. So that's an indication that you've separated the epidermis from the dermis and you've ripped the ridges away from the papillae and now you're going to accumulate fluid underneath that waterproof epidermis. But the dermis is not waterproof. So the water goes through the dermis and just pools right underneath the epidermis and creates that blister. Now here we see the reticular layer. Again, this is the deeper region. This is the majority of the dermis. And this is primarily where we see the accessory structures. Okay, We're also going to see large bundles of collagen fibers. They miss the end here. Like I said, there's lots of mistakes on this. So hopefully um, you're following along. You're not just trying to see these slides take notes. you got to listen to me. So there's large bundles of collagen fibers. And these collagen fibers and elastic fibers like to run in very specific directions. Okay, Now, these things are running in parallel bundles in our dermis, the collagen and the elastic fibers. They're running in these parallel bundles, and what they create is um, the major way that it resists forces when we move our body. So when we twist, when we bend, we don't tend to move every joint in every direction. We can't twist our torso in certain directions. And so these collagen elastic fibers have arranged themselves in specific ways to resist stress, to resist the tugging and the pulling, and then to snap back, right? So these bundles are in certain orientations. Here's an image and here are these lines of cleavage. So here is kind of the way that these bundles are oriented all across the body in our dermis. But what's important, the reason that they're called lines of cleavage, these are important for surgeons especially. Here we see a cut. Here we see another cut. The key here, look at this. Which one of these is going to stay open? The one that goes with the lines of cleavage is going to heal faster and stay closed. If you cut across these lines of cleavage, imagine you're cutting a rubber band and you're trying then to make the rubber band reconnect, right? So you made this incision and you cut that rubber band, but when it's healing, it's trying to reconnect and that's not going to happen very easily. So here you can even see these lines representing elastic fibers. If you cut this, then it's not going to want to heal, but instead it's going to want to peel this wound open and keep the wound opening. So if you go against or perpendicular to the lines of cleavage, then that wound is not going to heal very easily. It's going to be, it's going to cause some damage, right? Not a good thing. So incisions again should be parallel to the lines of cleavage so that they heal quickly, not perpendicular, which to remain open. They keep reopening many times. Okay. Now, Sometimes the body grows faster than the collagen fibers can grow, and the collagen fibers are then torn, and they're ripped. When we see that, when the body grows, the skin grows faster than it usually does, then it can produce new skin, we see stretch marks. They're also called striae, but I think stitch, stick with stretch marks. This is where collagen fibers have been torn because they've stretched too far and they just ripped. And so you're visibly seeing that on the surface as a stretch mark. Wrinkles, I want you to know, is due to loss of elastic ability. Over time, you stretch and recoil those elastic fibers over and over and over again, and eventually they stop recoiling. And so that's what creates a wrinkle. Again, stretch marks are due to collagen fibers kind of wearing out, and wrinkles are due to elastic fibers wearing out. Now, I do want you to be familiar that there is a lot of innervation. So that means that there's a lot of nerves. There's different sensory and motor nerve fibers. And there's also a lot of blood vessels in the dermis. So these are just facts. You don't have to write these two down. But what I want you to understand is that there's a lot of nerves. 
and that there's a lot of blood vessels in the dermis. The nerves are important for sensation. They can also control other things, but I want you to mainly think about sensory, the ability to sense our environment, touch. There are a lot of blood vessels. The blood vessels in the dermis not only supply the dermis with blood, but I want you to be aware that the vessels in the papillary layer also provide the bottom of the epidermis with blood. The epidermis is avascular. It doesn't have blood, so it needs a little help. So the stem cells and those cells down in the very bottom layer, the stratum germanitivum, basal, these guys need blood, and so they need their nutrients. And so from those vessels that are right down in the dermis, we're going to allow those nutrients to just kind of float up into the epidermis and supply the lower layers of the epidermis. Now, I do want you to know that these blood vessels in the dermis are also important for regulating your body temperature. Okay, so these guys are important for regulating your body temperature. We can open these blood vessels and allow more heat to go out of the body, or we can close these vessels and allow heat to stay in the body. So vasoconstriction is closing and vasodilation is opening. So again, if we open it, we're going to release more heat. This is what happens whenever you start to exercise. You vasodilate towards the skin. Your skin appears more red, but you're trying to radiate out that heat. Whenever we're cold, we vasoconstrict, right? And skin looks pale because the blood is not as close to the surface anymore. The cutaneous layer. Again, this is not officially part of the integument, but it is going to be discussed here. And so I want you to be familiar with kind of its function and what's happening. Subcutaneous, again, is mainly adipose. When we look at it, we see that yellow. So it's mainly adipose, and this is subcutaneous fat. You've heard that before. But remember, adipose is like bubble wrap. So this is really kind of like a bubble wrap layer going all the way around our entire body. Right below our skin, we have bubble wrap, subcutaneous fat. So that's a good thing. It protects us from all sorts of um, issues, and it pads, protects the body, right? The other major thing that I like to mention about the subcutaneous is about injections, right? The injections, hypodermic needles, this is the place where we tend to put those injections is into the hypodermis or into that subcutaneous. This fat is an energy reserve. It is padding, protection, and insulation. And this fat is different in females versus males. Males tend to have less subcutaneous fat as females do. And a good way to think about this, uh, you know, instead of saying, well, females are fat and guys are not as fat. Well, that's about stupid. You know, everybody's a little bit different. But the key here, females have more subcutaneous fat on their body. And a good example is breast tissue. Breast tissue is really just adipose tissue. And then you've got some glands, some mammary glands in there. But the whole structure is not mammary glands whenever we're talking about the breast. Most of the breast is just adipose tissue. So there's an example. Males don't really have developed breasts. Females have more developed breasts. And so there's a good example without trying to be rude about it, you know, that proves why women have more subcutaneous fat on themselves compared to males, okay? Part of it, though, that we haven't talked about, this is due to the sex hormones. Male sex hormones induce less fat production, and female sex hormones induce more fat production. So it's just a little bit difference due to those sex hormones. Here's another view showing you the epidermis and the dermis and then the subcutaneous. You can take a look at this in your textbook if you'd like to get a little extra help. Now, as I mentioned, we're going to flow from the layers into the um, accessory structures. Now, again, I like to call them accessory structures. They like to call them epidermal derivatives. And again, this textbook just has to change things just to make itself known. Um, this is not the best textbook, to be quite honest with you. And part of their problem is that they like to change things too much, right, and try to become a little more proprietary, a little bit more, you know, I'm the end thing. But really... Accessory structures is a better term instead of derivatives. I do want you to understand where this term comes from. Most of these accessory structures are made from epidermis. They're made out of epidermis, so they're derived from epidermis. So that's where they get their names. So nails, hair, and glands. Let's start with hair. Okay, so hair, and then I think we're going to go nails and then glands. Hair is found almost everywhere on the body. Shouldn't find it where we have thick skin 
right? Shouldn't find it on the lips. That's just weird. Above and below the lips, maybe, but not on your lips. That's just kind of weird. And then the external genitalia, if you think about it, um, the labia minora of the female should not have hair on it, but also the body of the penis should not have hair on it either because that would interfere with the actions of reproduction. So we see it everywhere except for in just a handful of locations. Now, a hair is properly called a pillus. So sometimes you see the word pillus or pili whenever we refer to hair. So one hair is a pillus, and it's really just like compacted skin. It's truly just keratinized cells, and they're growing in a tube, and they're growing out of this structure here, and you need to take a note of that. The hair follicle. This is considered to be the organ where hair is produced. And what it does is it just kind of wraps around this hair and it helps to produce that hair and protect it. And so growing from the base are going to be some keratinized cells just like skin. And instead of a, a sheet like skin, we're going to put them into a tu tube and create hair. Now, the bottom of the hair, hair is called the root. Whatever is below the skin is the root, and the visible portion of the hair outside of the skin is called the shaft. The very bottom of the root is an expanded region called the hair bulb. Just like a bulb you might plant in your garden, the hair bulb is kind of where the growth takes place. In there, and we'll see this in lab, there's going to be a hair papilla, and that structure is there to allow the blood vessels to come in and out to allow for that growth, to keep growing that hair. Now, I'm not going to worry about the term hair matrix or the medulla and the cortex. I do want you to be familiar with the term hair follicle. Again, the hair follicle, this is the organ where hair is produced. Okay, It does tend to look like epidermis wrapping around the hair. So a purple outer layer wrapping around the hair is going to be our hair follicle. Connected to each hair is a muscle, and I hate that it just says erector pili. I always like to write the words erector pili muscle, so I say put the word muscle after it, and that tells you that the erector pili is a muscle that makes the hair stand up, erect, right? And so this is what causes goosebumps. It makes your hair stick up, but this is what causes those goosebumps, is when the smooth muscles contract due to being cold, or excited, especially being cold, it's trying to trap air around your body to heat you up. So those erector pili muscles, important for heat. Here's the hair. Here we notice, here's the epidermis, and here we can even see, here's the hair follicle, extension of the epidermis that just wraps around the hair all the way around it. Down here is, or inside the skin is the root. Outside of the skin is the shaft, the expanded bottom is the hair bulb, and there's that hair papilla where we have the blood vessels going in and out, keeping that tissue alive. There are three flavors of hair. Lanugo is a fine, downy hair that is only in fetuses. So you have this inside of mama. It appears in the last trimester and this hair is usually shed before you're born and it comes out with the afterbirth with the placenta. And so usually people don't see the lanuga but this is just a fine hair that's in utero inside mama when you're a fetus. Velus hair. Velus hair are the main human hairs that cover most of the body. These are the finer hairs on our arms and our legs. Um, these are there for protection and kind of there also to um, provide that insulation. Terminal hair are thicker, darker hairs, coarser, pigmented, and they're longer, right? So the hair on your arm, you can't grow like the hair on your head. So terminal hairs are on your scalp your eyebrows and your eyelashes. They're in men's beards. During puberty, wherever we see hair forming, we're converting velus into terminal. So in the armpits and also in the pubic regions, we're going to see hair start to develop at puberty. And so we notice that some of this terminal hair is actually controlled by the sex hormones. Okay. Now, wherever we start to see this hair pop up, we're also going to see a new gland pop up. So if you want to give yourself a note, wherever the terminal hair pops up at puberty, we also start to get apocrine glands. And these glands are going to make a stinky secretion. And that's the reason your armpits start to stink. 
functions of hair. As we mentioned just a second ago, protection. It protects your scalp from sunburn. It protects it from injury. Hair in your nose and your ears and your eyes helps prevent entry of foreign things. And so very much a protective function. As I also mentioned, Heat, uh, heat retention, those goosebumps are going to create a layer of heat surrounding your body and that will keep that heat into your body. And so they're creating those goosebumps helps to insulate the body. There's a little thing called a root hair plexus, and we'll talk about it when we get over to chapter 13 or chapter 12 or something. But this is a sensory receptor. Sensory receptor means that it can detect touch, right, in this sensation, in this um, way, in this kind of fashion that we're talking about right now, that this structure can detect touch. So there's something called a root hair plexus attached to each, each root of the hair is a little nerve, and if that hair is moved, it sends a signal to our brain. There are still a lot of diseases carried by mosquitoes. So our bodies, we have evolved to realize some of these mosquitoes, most of these mosquitoes and things that crawl on us are not out to do us good. They're out to do us harm. And so even without realizing it, if you feel a few of these hairs start to move, you'll automatically smack it, you'll automatically itch it, do something to it because you're, it's, a re, it's a reflex because your body, you're, you're totally concerned that there might be a mosquito stinging you and giving you some sort of um, bad virus or something. We use hair for visual identification, right? So the different coloration of the hair, how long it is, what you're doing with it, hair on the face, no hair on the face. It can tell us a lot, right? It can be involved with age, sex, um, identifying specific individuals. I've got one friend. He's got a big bushy beard. He kind of looks a little bit like Jesus. But then his hair is very straight, and it looks like the Incredible Hulk, right? So his nickname is Hulk Jesus, and it's all based on his hair, right, by the way he looks. And so um, Hulk Jesus gets his name because of the visual identification that his hair allows everybody to see, right? Something else, hairs disperse chemicals, specifically pheromones. Pheromones are types of chemical signals involved with attracting sexual partners, okay? So, you release pheromones from the base of these hairs, from these sweat glands, and um, that can attract a partner. Hair color, exactly like skin, it's colored with melanin, and the melanin starts down in the base and it gets uh, and it grows out and up with the hair. Okay, now it's really reflecting your genetics, but the environment and hormones can change it. So as we let sun hit it, it gets lighter. If we get stressed, it gets lighter, it gets grayer, right? So other things can affect it. Growth rate, you don't have to worry about a third of a millimeter per day. What I want you to know is that the average hair lives about two to five years, right? After that two to five years, it hits a dormant phase where it stops growing for a few months. And at that point, that hair is shed out and it's released. Then we're going to reactivate that follicle and create a brand new hair. Right. So this is what happens all the time when you're taking a shower, you pull a few hairs out. It's not that you're pulling hairs out. It's just that it's that you are getting rid of those that are at the end of their life cycle and they are about to be replaced with a brand new hair in that follicle. Now, if you don't replace it with a new hair, that's going to lead to balding, right? Thinning. So hair loss, normal loss, 10 uh, hairs off your head a day, that's normal. If you've got too much, something's going on, right? Drugs, diet, radiation, stress, fever, something's going on. Thinning and loss of hair is, re is referred to as alopecia. So removal, you know, losing the hair, not being able to grow hair is a term referred to as alopecia. Females tend to exhibit diffuse hair loss. So this means that females don't tend to have little patches of bald hair. They tend to go thin, right? So hair is shed across all parts of the scalp. So females tend to get thinning hair. Males tend to have these patterns of this, this hair loss where total baldness takes place. So this is um, a sex-linked trait, really. And so um, male pattern baldness is more active in males compared to females, right? 
Now let's mention nails. I'm not going to talk about these very much, but let's talk about them. Nails are simply compacted keratin. So they are just super compacted keratin, just like skin and hair, except for they're super compacted. They cover the tips of the fingers and the toes. They help protect us, and they help to grab objects. Whenever we squeeze, at least we don't pop our nails. Now I'm not going to go through all of this or we don't pop our fingers and we don't rupture them for example. I'm not going to go all th through all of these parts of the nail but here we can see the nail and we can see the free edge of the nail. This is what you clip off with the fingernail clippers. Down here we have this white lanula. This is another part that we can use, um, especially for diagnosis. Um, and there's other components to this nail. Nail coloration and the shape of the nail can tell us a lot about the um, physical health of a person. So nails are also another health indicator. Let's move on, let's talk about glands in the skin. Again, these are exocrine glands, not endocrine because they're secreting onto a surface. So we have two different groups, sweat glands or pseudoriferous glands, and then we also have sebaceous glands. Sweat glands or pseudoriferous glands release the watery sweat we're familiar with. Sebaceous glands release sebum, and this is an oil. Sweat glands again, um, they're going to have pore that's going to go to the outside and it's going to release that sweat onto the surface. This is important for cooling the surface. It's important for, um, and here are the main type of sweat glands, the merocrine sweat gland. So merocrine sweat glands are the most numerous and widely distributed. These, these are the ones that release your typical sweat. Releasing typical sweat is called sensible perspiration. To release water through a sweat pore is sensible perspiration. If we have water evaporate through the skin, that's called insensible perspiration. And so this is simply just due to evaporation. Okay, so just a small amount, as I mentioned, like 1% happens. Okay, or excuse me, one um, cup of water per day is going to evaporate that way. Again, this type of sweat is important to cool the skin off, thermoregulation. Okay, it's also important to dilute harmful chemicals. It is antibacterial as well. So this can help to control bacteria on the surface of the skin. Apocrine glands, these are the ones that develop during puberty. So give yourself that note. These develop in the same places that hair grows, armpits, around the nipples, and in the pubic regions, in the um, regions in the pelvic area. So as a result, where we start to see hair growing, we also have these glands forming. These glands make a thicker, stinkier type of sweat. Okay, it's got lipids in it. And so now, if bacteria can act on this, it's going to start eating it and it's going to start stinking. Now, especially if you don't allow air to circulate in these areas, it'll start to um, eat it faster, it'll start to stink faster. And so that's the whole deal with the armpits, right? Because your arms are always folded. You're creating that anaerobic environment, and it encourages that stink to start to be um, formed. Again, sebaceous glands make sebum, and sebum is oil. It's not a lubricant. It's a moisturizer for the skin and the hair. It is antibacterial as well. Sebaceous glands are connected to each hair. So there's a sebaceous gland with each hair, and it releases that oil at the base of the hair, and it just kind of... Um, moisturizes the skin surrounding the hair and then it travels up the hair and kind of moisturizes it there. If we have a sebaceous gland that doesn't have a hair attached to it, then we're going to call it a sebaceous follicle. And a sebaceous follicle, I want you to know, is what's responsible for causing acne. Okay, this is what causes a pimple, is when a sebaceous duct gets clogged and then bacteria start to eat it and we start to see that. Okay, so acne is really just the block sebaceous pores and then we start to see a minor infection starting to lead up in there, right? And that's the reason it starts to get red. So using different treatments, we can clean those out and start to counteract some of that acne. Some of the other glands, ceraminous glands, these are create cerumen. I want you to know this is earwax, okay? And then mammary glands. I want you to know that mammary glands are actually modified apocrine glands, 
right? This produces milk. These are modified underarm stinker glands. So we change that and we create milk, right? So milk is intended to be for babies, right? And so adults shouldn't drink milk, especially milk from another animal. So I'm not sure if you had cereal this morning, but you may have had some cow sweat, some cow underarm sweat up in your cereal. Now I'm just kidding, but really that's kind of what's going on. These mammary glands are modified underarm sweat. They're very close to the underarms. And so as a result, we kind of see that modification. Here, Let's talk real quick about some of the functions of the epidermis. And we've actually kind of already hit this. It's involved with protection, right? Physical protection from injury and trauma, from chemicals, from toxins, from bad microbes, from something that's not mentioned here that I want you to know is from dehydration. And that's got its own function right here, prevent water loss. Another major function is to stop water loss from the body. And so skin, again, it's water resistant, not waterproof, but it's water resistant to keep fluid in, not to keep it out, right? It's not completely waterproof and that small one cup every day that, that just kind of evaporates out through the skin is that insensible perspiration that we just talked about. Metabolic regulation. Again, sunlight is going to mix with vitamin D3. We get D3 in our milk. We drink that. It goes to our skin. Sunlight then um, gets exposed to this vitamin D3, and it's eventually going to convert it into this calcitriol. calcitriol. And this is what absorbs calcium and phosphate into the body. So I definitely want you to know, as far as UV radiation and vitamin D3, it absorbs calcium and phosphate into our intestines. Now, we also have some absorption and secretion characteristics and functions here. Secretion, we're going to secrete um, sweat and sebum. And in sweat, we're going to get rid of waste products. So sweat is very similar to urine. It's got urea, it's got salts, it's got waters, it's got various things in it that are also found in our urine. And so we're going to secrete some of these things out. And we can absorb some things, very few things in transdermally. Right, so if we have patches, right, so the nicotine patch, the birth control patch, these sorts of patches can actually be absorbed through the skin and into those blood vessels in the dermis. And usually, again, these are things that need to be slow released so we keep a constant level at all times. Immune function. Skin is involved with immunity because it has some of those dendritic cells that I mentioned in that spinosum involved with, again, it's pathogens and also that skin cancer. So again, we've kind of already talked about these. It's just recapping it. Here's an image kind of demonstrating all those different functions. You can take a look at them in the textbook if you'd like. The dermis. To wrap up dermis functions, temp regulation, dealing with the blood vessels, opening and closing is a very important function, as well as sensory reception. The ability to add sensory receptors into the dermis to be able to create the sensation of touch and pressure and vibration, pain, temperature, things like that. Now, repair and regenerate the integumentary system. If you have repetitive mechanical stress, if you keep stressing your skin the same way over and over, it starts to thicken, right? We like to call these sometimes calluses, right? So a callus will develop. If you are a rock climber and you never climbed and you just started climbing, your skin is very thin and, and very weak. And then once you start climbing, you're going to start to develop these thick calluses on your hands. And that's going to help you to grab that rock better. Okay, so there's a good example. Regeneration. Again, we don't repair the, in the uh, epidermis. We just regenerate it. So as far as the epidermis, we're going to regenerate a lot of those tissues instead of uh, cells and instead of trying to repair them. We're just going to replace them with brand new fresh cells and let the old damaged cells just die. Okay. Now, fibrosis. Whenever we have a scar, that scar is kind of referred to as a fibrosis. This is a gap filled with scar tissue. So if you cut yourself, you're going to fill it up with a whole bunch of collagen. 
and that is a type of fiber and that's called a fibrosis. Now usually we're not going to have the same activities. So if we just have fibers instead of something else, then usually we're going to change our function though. Okay. Now to start to wrap this up, let's talk about these stages of wound healing. So three stages of wound healing. There's images in the textbook and they look like this. We're going to use the title of these stages as the title of our four steps. So you can just learn those four steps as our title. Here I'm going to come back. First we cut the blood vessels and we bleed into the wound. Then we're going to form a blood clot and we're going to let white blood cells start to clean it. Then we're going to start to regrow blood vessels and we're going to have kind of pre-scar scar tissue called granulation tissue. And then the epithelium is going to regenerate and the connective tissue fibrosis is going to occur. So let's take a look. Let's see this. Again, wound healing, when you cut yourself, it's not rapid. It takes time. The more severe the damage is, the longer it's going to take and the less likely it's going to return to the original conditions. So you may do damage to some of those accessory structures and never regain that function. Here we're seeing that cut. We're seeing blood. Second, we're seeing a blood clot. And this is allowing some white blood cells to come in and clean the area up. But we're also starting to see the epidermis grow. So we see the epidermis trying to grow back around this cut to reestablish that epidermis. It starts to push the epidermis up. And as it does that, we start to see the scar tissue forming down here, granulation tissue. So blood vessels regrow and granulation tissue forms. Eventually, we're going to regenerate all the epi. We're going to shed the scab. And we're going to have not as major of scar tissue as we had in the beginning, right? So it's important for you to allow that um, to heal before you remove that scab. If you pick that scab right here, where well, you're just going to encourage infection, right? Definitely not a good thing. So don't pick at your scabs, folks. Let's talk very quickly about burns. Burns can be caused by heat. They can be caused by radiation like the sun or from something like a nuclear radiation. Um, they can be caused by chemicals. So different things, um, you know, if you get certain chemicals on your skin, then it will burn them as well. So there's different levels of burns. And the problem is that they go thicker. They go deeper. Eventually, we start to have trouble with fluid loss. So the body wants to lose too much fluid and there it could dehydrate to death. We also have issues with infection, right? So we need to monitor infection as well. So usually we're going to put this person who's had severe burns into some sort of confined area, a bubble, so to speak, where we can control and make sure that there's no infection and control how much fluid is being lost from their body. First degree burns only affect the epidermis. This is a sunburn. That's the good example. Okay, red, painful, right? So this is a sunburn. This is a first degree burn. It's a good example. Second degree burn. It, in, it involves the epidermis, but now it also involves the dermis. We're going a little bit deeper. These are the most painful because we don't destroy the nerves. We just kill part of them and that pisses them off and they let us know that they're upset in the form of pain right we're going to see blistering start to occur and we're going to have some scarring that's going to follow this so this is going to take a longer time to heal third degree burns are the worst we've burned through the epi and the dermis and we're getting down to the sub q layer finally and now we've really burned off the entire integument so this is going to require some hospitalization, as I said, for dehydration and infection. we got to be careful. We're also going to start losing a lot of heat, so we're going to have to add more calories. So we're going to have to increase additional calor caloric intake to help with that. Severe scarring will take place, and many times a skin graft is needed. Okay, so skin graft is simply take a sample of skin, grow a layer of skin outside of the body, and we can attach that skin back to the human body to recover that area that's been burned. Now, how can we estimate severe burn and how quick somebody might need attention, right? We use something called the rule of nines, and what the rule of nines does, and this picture is not the best, divides the body up into sections of 9%. 9%, 2 times 9 is 18%, right? And so if an EMT gets on the scene and the people working with the ambulance notice that someone has burned this arm, their head, this leg, and half of their torso, 
Well, they can add it up, 9, 9, maybe 9, and then 18. If you get more than 20 to 30% of the body burned, you have a severe burn situation. And so you need to take care of that immediately. And if not, this person is in extreme danger. So that's what the rule of nines does. It allows an estimate of how much has been affected so that we can try to get the proper attention to that person as quick as possible. Now, of course, at the end, we're going to have some aging information. Of course, everything craps out, right? So skin starts to crap out. Stem cells not as active as many. So repair and regeneration takes longer, and we're going to start to get thinner skin as we get older. Collagen fibers, not as many. Elastic fibers lose elasticity, so we're going to start to see more wrinkling, right? Immune structures, the, the dendritic cells, they're going to be less of them, so we're going to get less immune response. The hair follicles will produce thinner hair if they produce hair at all right so as I mentioned UV radiation can cause skin cancer and this is the most common type of cancer too much UV radiation without protection will damage the DNA especially in those stem cells and now we've got an extremely bad situation on the hand right so fair skin individuals are more at risk for skin cancer if you have dark skin well, you are in luck because you naturally have more sunscreen than, than a fair skin person. And so you are less likely to develop skin cancer in your lifetime, which is a great, great advantage there. Uh, three different um, types of skin cancer are pointed out here. So basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, malignant melanoma. You can read about those if you're interested, but I'm not going to put these on the test. Last thing we're going to talk about very quickly is Botox. Botox is botulism toxin. Yes, the same thing from food poisoning, botulism. So Clostridium botulinum is what the bacteria that's going to cause this toxin. But some people have realized that if they inject this toxic chemical into their muscles, then their muscles freeze. They stop functioning, right? It's not that they prevent wrinkles. It stops your muscles from moving. That makes the face look like it has less wrinkles, less facial expression. And so as a result, you're shooting this toxin into your facial muscles to freeze them, to paralyze them. Just like block jaw is caused by, um, you know, kind of tetanus, it's the same kind of thing. And so it freezes those muscles so they no longer function and wrinkles seem to be disappearing, right? But this is temporary. And the big problem is if you do this over and over and over again, then your muscles will not start responding again. They will remain paralyzed for the rest of your life. So you look at people like back in the day, Joan Rivers, she had so much Botox in her face that it didn't even move whenever she moved her mouth. Whenever she tried to smile, nothing happened. She tried to frown, nothing happened. You know, so over usage of this is definitely a bad thing. You know what? We all get older. We all grow older and it's okay. So it's okay to just accept who we are. Um, I don't really care what anybody thinks about me because it's not going to affect me in the long run and that's a good attitude to have the older we get so enjoy your wrinkles you know you've earned them so don't try to cover them up that gives that shows your experience versus other people right so hopefully you were able to learn from this recording and you saw this before you come to class, and then I'll add a little bit to this as we're in class if you have any questions feel free to contact me otherwise have a great day